How many people have a secret life? Maybe not as dramatic as someone who has, a, you know, that second family in the other town, that traveling salesman with two different families. Or, or maybe not a secret identity with which you fight crime as a maxed vigilante. But instead, the more mundane version, where that person changes how they behave significantly based on the context. You don't have to have a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of dichotomy where one part of your life is very good and the other is very evil. Although that certainly would be cause for serious concern. But a lot of people change how they interact with the world in dramatic ways when circumstances change. Why is that? Why the inconsistency? Is it a sign of wisdom or tact to change with the circumstances? Or is it a sign of duplicity or cynicism? Those are important questions, and they're not all hard and fast answers. We, we really need to think on these things. But to begin to answer them, we must ask ourselves why. There might be two or more versions of you or me. Why is it that parts of us are in conflict with ourselves? In Genesis 12, we're about to see Abram get in just this sort of way. Excuse me, act in just this sort of way. In difficult circumstances, he will choose to act in a way that feels foreign to what we would expect from this man chosen by God. So let's take a look at this brief episode that people sometimes just skip right over, but there's, uh, there's some wisdom here. Let's take a look at verse 10. It says, now there was a famine in the land. This brief account has a narrative that is actually paralleled with the end of Genesis and the story of Joseph. Joseph, if you take a look, some of the exact same wording and phrases are used in Joseph's story and in Abram's. In Joseph's day, there will also be a famine that will prompt hard choices. He will make better choices than his great-grandfather Abram. Note that Abram's presence in Canaan, now that he is living here, did not alter the normal ebb and flow of rain and harvests. Good years and bad years, they continued as usual. And Abram experienced them just as did his Canaanite neighbors. This famine demanded a response from him, just as it did everyone else. In other words, God's promises to Abram didn't absolve him of the need to live his life like a normal person. He still needed to respond to the circumstances. And so he did. Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. Let's put this uh, out in front. Abram's choice here was a reasonable one. I've seen some commentators say, ah, oh, he should have stayed. He didn't ask permission to go to Egypt or he didn't ask God's uh, if that was the right choice. I don't think that's the point of this passage at all. Egypt's position on the Nile with its annual floods made it steadier with respect to years when there was less rain. If anyone's going to have food to sell when times are tough, it's the Egyptians. Abram goes there and so does Jacob's family. Abram's upcoming failure won't be because he went to Egypt. Trusting in God did not require Abram to make foolish choices in order to create more dependence on God. That's not what faith is. Living by faith doesn't mean that you ignore reality or live in a fantasy realm. Reality is real. Living by faith doesn't mean that we ignore it. Rather, living by faith means that we trust God, no matter what that reality turns out to be. So it was realistic for Abram to go to Egypt. That's not where he got into trouble. Here is where it is begins. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know you are what a beautiful woman you are. Now, if this was the whole story, 
we'd be given props to Abram for being a smooth talker who still knows how to compliment his wife after their many years of marriage. You can't go wrong with reminding your wife that you think she's beautiful. It's, it's just a rule. Just guys, we know that, right? Women, you understand, you appreciate it no matter how many times you've heard it. Unfortunately for Abram, this is not a simple compliment. It's actually one of those compliments meant uh, to get you somewhere, and that's not the right way to do it. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. Whoa. Now that is a pretty dark assessment of how Egyptians treat sojourners in their land. Now we have absolutely no way to confirm or deny the validity of Abram's fear. Maybe it was a reasonable fear. Maybe he had heard stories. Maybe it was just the kind of thing that happened in his day. Maybe it was ridiculous. Maybe he was being a bit of a worry wart. Either way, his subsequent actions will prove to us that he genuinely was afraid of entering Egypt with a beautiful wife on his arm. This whole episode raises a serious moral question. Do we have the right to preemptively do something immoral to protect ourselves from the evil that we believe others are plotting against us? Now, this is different from a scenario, from a question of self-defense. If someone right now is trying to harm you or an innocent person, you have a moral right to defend yourself or someone else from harm because the need to do so is active and real. But what about hypothetical situations? What about hunches and the like? It's one thing to lock your door at night to take a precaution, or maybe to install a security camera. It's a whole different category if you start digging deadly booby traps outside the windows of your home, right? And, and putting trip wires and, and, and whatnot around. Preemptive actions are much more morally suspect especially if that preemption itself is morally objectionable in its own right. Because such things are a dangerous step forward to trying to use the excuse that the Apostle Paul utterly rejected in Romans 3.8. You'll, you'll remember it when I hear it, when, when I say it. Let us do evil that good may result. The Apostle Paul says that is a dead end. We do not do that. If we start preemptively taking actions, especially morally suspect ones, we're pretending that we can make something good happen by doing evil, and that's not true. To choose evil is never what God desires of us. No matter what the circumstances may be, no matter if we are genuinely afraid for our lives, evil is not an option. It just isn't. But that's what, Paul, what Abram chooses. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. Abram's assumption about the lack of morals from the Egyptians prompts him to preemptively demonstrate a lack of moral character on his own part. That's not good. This whole shoot first and ask questions later attitude might seem cool uh, when it's Han Solo taking out the bounty hunter Greedo in Star Wars or uh, in one of the old westerns that that's modeled after if you prefer. But that is an absolute disaster as a guide to moral behavior. Abram did not know what the Egyptians would do. He assumed it. But even if he was right about them, his own response was not to trust God to protect him, but instead to be underhanded in a way that actually puts his beautiful wife that he just told her, hey, you're beautiful, it, he put her at risk. 
while at the same time minimizing the risk to himself. Aside from the dishonor of lying and asking your wife to lie, a real man, and I know that is a loaded term, I don't mean any of the other things about that that sometimes people are talking about, but a real man doesn't put his wife or his kids at risk to keep himself from real danger, let alone from only hypothetical danger. That's just not what we do. That's not the way this works. This is a bad look for Abram. While he just recently demonstrated faith in God by journeying to Canaan, that was a big deal. Somehow, in his mind, that faith doesn't either either extend to Egypt geographically. Are we outside of God's control here? Maybe that's what he thought. People in the ancient Near East thought that way about their gods. But that would be weird. Or maybe he didn't think that these grand promises that God made applied to the nitty-gritty of his personal life. That also seems odd. Whatever the thought process was that Abram used to arrive at this plan, Abram was acting as if God is too small or too weak to protect him in this distant land or in this difficult situation. Abram failed to demonstrate that his belief in God was big enough for all occasions. Which again, this it blows our minds because we know what's going to happen with Isaac later, where he's going to demonstrate a faith that, that blows our minds. And yet here, in this moment, he doesn't have it. A young David will, in later generations, demonstrate a faith big enough to take on a giant. Daniel will demonstrate a faith strong enough to stand in front of lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in front of a fiery furnace. But here, at least, at least in this moment, Abram will be joining the ranks of later heroes who stumble when the chips are down. Gideon, who says, you know, God, I'm not sure you really want me, and he puts him to the test over and over Elijah, who despairs and says, Lord, you might as well take my life. I'm the only one left. Esther, who says, you know, maybe I'm not the right person to stand up here. Until Mordecai talks her into her. And of course, most famously, Peter, who runs his mouth off and then falters and weeps bitterly at his failure. Now, normally that's good company. If I said, hey, you're a lot like Gideon and Elijah and Esther and Peter. You'd be like, sweet, that, that's good. But it reminds us that living by faith is hard. Even the heroes among us can stumble and fall when put to the test. Humility ought to help us keep our feet planted firmly on the ground and our trust kept in the Almighty. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. Abram uh, didn't give the Egyptians a chance to do the right thing. His lies ensured that Pharaoh would end up, doing, uh, end up on the wrong path through no fault of his own. We do things like this on social media when we assume that the motives of the people we don't know must be suspect because they disagree with us uh, about this or that political or cultural topic. I instead of assuming that others have sincere reasons for their convictions, our jaundiced view jumps to the they're out to get us conclusion or the they hate America conclusion or the they're in the league with the devil conclusion. That kind of thinking helps ensure our response to that will be hostile or snarky or both. This is, of course, not how Jesus conducted himself when interacting with people he didn't personally know. But many of us do it far too often in this life. Well, Pharaoh treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. This whole episode 
might feel like a Twilight Zone episode to you. There are things happening here that just don't seem normal. The reason why it feels that way is very simple. Abram and Sarai and, and the Egyptians are living in a cultural stream that influences how they think and feel and act that is very different from our own. Moses, writing about this about uh, 600 years later, was close enough to grasp what was going on here. But for us, it's difficult to do. People living in the ancient Near East and those living in the 21st century in America have significantly different assumptions and ideas about things like marriage and women and what honor is and the rule of law and so many other topics that don't impact this particular episode but are still there too. Why am I highlighting this? It isn't because I think we can't understand this story in Genesis as Moses intended it. Rather, it's a word of caution that we ought to be careful about how certain we are when drawing conclusions about what we think is happening. Here's an example. Is Abram in the wrong here? Absolutely. Can we pinpoint the exact way in which his failure would have been understood by his contemporaries? What exactly he's doing wrong and why? No, probably not. But we don't need to. We can tell that Abram lied, that Sarai was put at risk by his lie, and that Abram benefited from this deception while she may have suffered for it. That's enough information to allow us to see that Abram should have done something else. Again, we're removed from his situation. Maybe we can't see what he should have done, but it shouldn't have been this. This path is not the right one. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. Verse 17 confirms our conclusion that Abram's choice was unacceptable to God. We may not be able to reproduce Abram's thought process with confidence, but the text tells us that God was not happy about it. So why was Pharaoh's household the one affected when the guilt lay elsewhere? Well, sin doesn't always move in a straight line when it makes consequences. What we do or what we fail to do affects other people. In this case, Abram's deception harms people who until just a bit ago were strangers to him. They don't know him and they don't know his God either for that matter. And yet they are being are in a difficult situation, are suffering because of Abram and his failure to trust his God. How did Pharaoh know that this sudden uh, onset of illness was related to Sarai? Why, Why didn't he run to some other conclusion? We have no way of knowing. But he got God's message, and he got it quickly. Because Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Those are all good questions. They're all fair ones that Abram does not have a good answer for. We don't know if this particular Pharaoh was a moral or an immoral man. We don't know anything about him. Did he himself have a list of people with legitimate complaints against him? In other words, is this the pot calling the kettle black? We have no idea. But you know what? It doesn't really matter. That is not the standard of our conduct when we answer to God for what we've done. We need to do what is right in all circumstances. We can't mistreat others, even if some people might write them off and say, oh, that person's not worth being kind to. You don't have to be honest to them. You don't have to be decent to someone like that. God's people are called to be better than that. This time, Abram failed. This time, He defamed his God, 
along with, his, with himself. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Let's be honest, Pharaoh's response is extremely lenient. He could have had Abram killed on the spot, and his contemporaries, the people in his court, would not have faulted him one bit. He could have thrown Abram in prison and said, learn, think about what you've done. He could have had him beaten or flogged or something before sending him away. So we don't know Pharaoh's motivations here, why he acted this way. But he was doing, he is, his mercy is more than Abram deserved. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. One last note on Pharaoh. He didn't confiscate the possessions that Abram had acquired when Pharaoh thought that this was a new relationship with a brother-in-law. That, at least, seems like it would have been fair. Something akin to that childhood taunt that you probably remember from the playground. Cheaters never prosper. Which, as you grow up, you realize it's not actually true. Uh, Pharaoh was merciful to Abram. And you know what? So was God. Because Abram's not punished for this. Lastly, as we close out this episode of Abram's uh, and Sarah, Sarai's brief sojourn in Egypt, we would do well to ponder the lesson this text has for us about the need to trust God in all circumstances and the need to do what is moral and what is upright, even if we've got a bad feeling about what might happen if we do. Three thoughts of application. Number one, Abram, Abraham and Sarah are huge heroes of the faith, no doubt about it. But their lives had challenges in them, much like our own. They had tough choices to make. Number two, anticipating that evil would be done to him, Abram chose to sin to try to avoid it. In that choice, he failed to fully trust God. Which leads us to us, our calling is to do that which is morally upright, whatever the circumstances may be.